Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Lagerquist. I am here with Buying Faith in Action, and we've got a collection of the Manahan family. They're all here to see Pat Anderson, uh, their grandmother, sister, sister-in-law, friend, all kinds of things, uh, here to present on an adventure that she took a couple of years ago uh, as she was uh, just out of college, I believe, so it was early 60s, is a presentation that I have seen before through the Mankato Kiwanis Club, but we all enjoyed it so much that I asked Pat to come and share here at Vine. So Pat, you will have to unmute yourself. And now look for the little cue that I just sent over for you. Thank you. All right, and I will step aside. Pat, if you wanna give any kind of little introduction about yourself first or set us up for what we're about to learn about, that would be fantastic. So I will, uh, I will mute myself and step aside, but I'll be right here if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, I'm coming to you live from beautiful downtown Mankato, Minnesota, and I wanna talk about a once in a lifetime adventure, at least that's what I call it. Um, in 1959, Lucy Kramer Helfter and I graduated from college with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree. Uh, Lucy was originally from St. Charles, Minnesota, and I was from Medelia. Um, when we got out of school, we decided we wanted to see the world. And so we worked for one year in New Orleans. During that time, we took a trip of the Carib uh, a Caribbean trip, oh, oh. Now I, my, my, uh, my presentation doesn't work, Mike. Oh. So it doesn't forward. Okay, oh. try, just try clicking on it. You might not have it actually at the forefront. There. Oh, there, there it worked. You're a genius, thank you. I've been here before. <laughs> <laughs> so we worked for a year in uh, New Orleans. During that time, we toured the Caribbean and Haiti and Jamaica. Uh, then we moved to California and worked for a year in Palo Alto. And um, we saved all our money. And on July, uh, aug in August of 1961, so almost 60 years ago, we quit our jobs and we drove to uh, New York City. We spent a few days there touring around. And then we went out to Hoboken, New Jersey and got on the SS New Amsterdam. Now this ship took two weeks to cross the Atlantic Ocean and it cost about $200 meals included. Um, we had a wonderful time on board the ship. I like this picture because you can see the Empire State Building in the back. You can also see a couple of members of the Canadian National Hockey Team, they were on board. And so we really had a good time. Uh, our social life was great on, on board ship. Um, I wanted to, these, my old pictures are fuzzy, but I wanted to show you some more pictures of these guys because they were, uh, not only did we live in luxury aboard the ship, but they were really a lot of fun and made our two weeks fun. We finally docked in Rotterdam and I can use my cursor to show you where Rotterdam is on my map. This is a map that my grandson Finn, old Seth, drew for me and put on my computer. So thank you, Finn. Anyway. Uh, we, we docked in, Amps, in Rotterdam, and then we went up to Amsterdam. I had written down that a hotel with breakfast there cost us $1.40 in 1961. Uh, from, from Rotterdam, we took a, a train to Dusseldorf, Germany. And in Dusseldorf, we went right to the Volkswagen factory and we bought ourselves a brand new Volkswagen. And um, what do you think we call, paid for that? I think the list price was $1,400. Now that's not thousand, it's $1,400. And uh, I think we paid less because we got it right at the factory. Uh, from there we drove, I'm gonna go back here a minute. From, from Dusseldorf, we drove straight north and spent some time in Copenhagen. And then we went up to Stockholm, Sweden, because we wanted to get visas to go into Russia. So while we were waiting for our visas, we went to Oslo, Norway. We drove across Norway to view the fjords, came back to uh, 
Stockholm, got our visas, and then we had to take a ship to Helsinki, Finland. So I just have a couple of pictures here of Lucy and I um, eating at a roadside stand. This was in the Netherlands. We loved Copenhagen, uh, of course, there's the Little Mermaid. And in fact, in Copenhagen, we met some young men who uh, showed us around and um, on bicycles. We actually toured the city on bicycles. We stayed in youth hostels and places like that. And uh, frankly, I don't know why we attracted men all the time, but we, we seem to be able to do that. From uh, Helsinki, we took a plane and flew into Moscow. And um, I love this picture because it shows St. Basil's Cathedral in color. And uh, just uh, Moscow was just a whole different culture for us and such an exciting thing. So here starts our first adventure of the year. Our hotel was called the Hotel Bucharest. It was about a block from the Kremlin. Uh, our in-tourist guide could speak English. And she took us around Moscow. We toured the university where they told us there were 8 million students there because the tuition was free. And they also got a living stipend to be a student there. Um, we went shopping at the GUM. And the, but the main adventure of our life was when we were admitted into Red Square on November 7th. We happened to be there November 7th. Um, and it was the 44th anniversary of the 1917 revolution. Um, now, I have to tell you that my mother in Medillia was the editor and the publisher of the Medillia Times Messenger, and she had given me a press pass. And so that's how we got, I got into the press corps in Red Square on the day of the big celebration. There were um, soldiers or armed, uniformed men all over the place. Um, this is a picture of the Kremlin. Actually, I can't see it very well because uh, your pictures covered up. But this is where Khrushchev had his office at that time. And I suppose it's exactly where uh, Vladimir Putin has his offices today. That is the day, November 7th, that there was a huge celebration because the Russian people had just won the space race. So in Red Square, we found out uh, that Nikita Khrushchev was very popular. A big cheer went up in the crowd when he came out to stand on the mausoleum. Um, but there was band music, there were large military displays, um, space displays, athletic demonstrations. This celebration started about nine in the morning and went to five in the afternoon. So we were standing out there all day and it was November cold, chilly. Um, as you see, I have on my big fur coat. Anyway, when uh, this is a picture of Yuri Gagarin. He was the first man to orbit the earth, which he did in April of 1961. So he was a whole year ahead of Jan John Glenn's orbiting the earth. That day, Gagarin was awarded the Order of Lenin, and he was also named a hero of the Soviet Union. And I think that the Russians are still celebrating this victory because it was just in the news this lately because it's the in April 16th was the uh, 60th anniversary of Gagarin's orbit in his spaceship called Vostok. You remember hearing about that? Anyway, um, the young girls came up to Nikita Khrushchev. He's standing on the mausoleum. I showed this picture to show you what how big Red Square is. And also there is a picture of, there is, a, this, my cursor is on the mausoleum, which uh, doubled as a stage that day. Um, but anyway, children came up and handed Khrushchev white carnations. Uh, so that amused me. I think it, for the first time we saw a vastly different civilization. Was it a classless society? I don't know. We were not able to go into St. Basil's Cathedral. I think it was there just for show. I don't think it's used at all. 
and I wished I had that picture in color, but I don't. I wanted to show you some of the office buildings and apartment buildings in Moscow because I was so um, uh, amused that the, the people who had offices or apartments behind the big pictures, of course, had to sacrifice their sunlight for the sake of the state. Um, we uh, loved these pictures of women sweep. There were always women uh, sweeping the street and these women had brooms with long handles. So we thought that was, uh, you know, we had seen many women sweeping the streets with short handled brooms. One of the places we toured in Moscow was the subway. Every subway station was huge and elaborately decorated with framed pictures of art and chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. It was so big that they told us uh, that there, um, they didn't have to have any bomb shelters or anything like that, that the entire population of Moscow could fit into the subway stations. And we were fascinated with these uh, subway stations. It was amazing. I wanted, this is the opera house in Moscow and we weren't able to get into the opera house. Do you know why? Because they were sold out completely. And apparently they, they sell out all the time. Well, we did take a plane. Uh, this is the plane that we got on a rainy, foggy day, and it was unpressurized also. And but we flew to Leningrad. I think we. Uh, this was the era of Lenin, and in Leningrad, this statue had just been unveiled the day before we were there, and it looks drippy because it was such a rainy day, and so that's. But it was an era when Stalin was vilified and all traces of Stalin were gone from Russia, but Lenin was uh, hailed as a hero. Um, we took a plane back to Moscow and, and then flew back to Helsinki where we took a ship across the Baltic Sea all the way to East Germany. So in East Germany, we drove on the Autobahn all the way down to Berlin, that little blue spot on the map. We, um, oh, I pressed the wrong thing. We came into Berlin on Friedrichstrasse. And so we came from the east and came into the west at Checkpoint Charlie. When we were there, of course, um, some soldier wanted to take, he wanted us to take his picture with him. I don't know if he wanted a picture of the Volkswagen or he wanted a picture of us. I don't know, but uh, here, here he was, we took his picture. Um, now, in the center, I show West Berlin, which was a thriving metropolis at, at that time. And on the two outside pictures are pictures from East Berlin, showing hardly any people on the street, no cars at all. And the picture on the right actually shows rubble that was there in during World War II, never cleaned up after the war. Every time we went through a city, uh, came to a new city, we had to go and find a bookstore because we had to buy a map of the city and of the country and we had to exchange money. So yes, this was the day before a GPS. We had no GPS. We, we never got lost, but we only got around using maps. And in West Berlin, we easily found a bookstore and we met a woman who was there just biding her time reading. And her story was that she came over to West Berlin on August 12th, uh, this was 1961, um, because um, she and her husband had owned a business in East Berlin and they decided to move to the West. And uh, she couldn't, they couldn't come together. We called her Mrs. B. They couldn't come together because uh, the officials would have been suspicious. So she came over on August 12th and he was planning to come the next day and join her. However, that is the night that the Berlin Wall was hastily erected and they were separated. So when we talked to Mrs. B, we volunteered to bring her husband a letter because uh, we could, as tourists, we could go back and forth uh, through uh, Checkpoint Charlie, but she could not. So 
she sat down and wrote a letter to her husband. She was so grateful for us to do that. And we were a little scared about it. I think we carried the letter in our underpants because we, if we had, we had been caught, it would have been uh, against the law. So we easily found uh, her husband at their home. She had given us the address and he sat right down and wrote a return letter. Both of them were very educated and they spoke perfect English. He also sent a brooch um, to his wife as a Christmas present and I pinned that onto my dress. Um, we visited all afternoon with Mr. B, and but he was very hopeful. In fact, both of this couple were very hopeful that they would soon be um, reunited. I want to tell you a little bit about the wall. I like this picture because it shows a big cardboard wall behind the concrete wall so that the people couldn't even look into the west side of the city. Here's our car parked on the street, which of course is blocked off by, by the wall. This wall, by the way, ended up being 96 miles long and about 250 people were killed uh, going trying to go across there. Uh, first, there was barbed wire. The cement was at least eight feet high in most places. There was bro broken glass on the wall and um, I want you to tell me who knows how long Mr. and Mrs. B were separated in Berlin. Do you remember when Ronald Reagan had his famous speech and that was in 1987 and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That was 1987 and the wall did come down two years later. So to answer my own question, I can tell you that Mr. and Mrs. B were separated for 28 years if they, if they lasted. I often wondered what happened to them. Uh, when we were there, we were told that there were about 6,500 American soldiers guarding the border. On, our, on the west side, they put up a Christmas tree when we were there. But the comparison between the two cities was stark. When we left Berlin, we toured southern Germany, loved Heidelberg, you know, and Munich and Bavaria. And uh, then we decided that we had to go to Innsbruck uh, to see more of the Alps and also to go skiing. So that's exactly what we did. Now, Lucy and I had both belonged to the Sierra Nevada Ski Club when we lived in California. So we were not novices in terms of skiing in the mountains, but I can tell you these, the chairlifts and the whole thing at Innsbruck was so intimidating that we really, oh, but we figured out a way to enjoy our time skiing and I'll tell you the secret. Here's what it was. We went straight to the chalet, went to the bar, and each of us ordered a double martini. Then we sat and we enjoyed the looking out the window at the other skiers coming down the runs. And finally, after a half hour or so, 40 minutes, we were able to go out, get on the chairlifts, lift and ski fearlessly down those runs. Uh, so I recommend the double martini method. We did uh, drive over to Switzerland because we wanted to see the Matterhorn at Zurich. So just driving through the Alps was certainly an adventure. But when we left Switzerland, we went straight to Rome. And you know, at, when in Rome, do as the tourists do. And so, of course, we uh, visited the Fountain of Tivoli on the left shows Lucy and me with another guy we picked up. And on the right shows Lucy touring the um, Colosseum. I don't know how we attracted a bunch of guys there too, but we did. Um, we also went to the catacombs and the cathedrals and the museums. Um, we ate pizza, but our favorite place, of course, was St. Peter's Square. This is the Vatican at Del Conciliazione. I love to say that, but our favorite thing in the Vatican was the statue done by Michelangelo. The Pieta had been there for about 500 years. And when we were there, we could walk right up to it 
and uh, touch it, rub our fingers over this smooth marble. It really, we spend a long, long time just looking at this amazing work of art because it was so beautiful. It's probably, I just thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd, I'd ever seen. But our, our real, my real adventure started uh, when uh, we, we spent Christmas and New Year's in, in uh, Rome. And I, I got hired at the Salvadori Mundi International Hospital. I discovered that I could speak and understand Italian good enough. So, you know, there were, let me see, I wrote it down here, something like 36 dialects of Italian spoken in Italy. And my dialect was called broken Italian. But it was good enough so that I was hired by the hospital to special patients. They, um, there were a lot of tourists in Rome that would inadvertently land in the hospital. And some of these men wanted a nurse who could speak English. And so they were willing to pay me $75 for a shift. A shift was 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And it was six days a week, usually. And um, Sometimes I had two patients to special. I remember one time in one room, I had a man with a severe heart attack. And in the room right next to him, I had another man who had had an emergency hernia operation um, done. And uh, so those days when I had two patients, I got paid $150. Now, I didn't have a work permit for Italy and I never paid taxes, but these people just paid me in cash. So that's why we stayed in Rome so long because we really, um, I, I was, we were making money. Uh, now Lucy did not work at the hospital because she didn't uh, speak uh, the Italian language, but she did everything else like the laundry and she had to buy me some nurses uniforms. And every day she cooked dinner so that when I got off my shift at 7 p.m. We ate dinner together, and then we just had time to get to the opera house. So our second job was at the opera house, and we were hired as clappers. Now, what that means is that we sat up in the balcony, and there was a manager that told us when to start clapping and when we could stop clapping, because after every act, it was embarrassing if the players did not get at least 10 curtain calls. So... We did not get paid for this job, but we did get into the opera free every night, and we loved that. Um, if you think that was easy, wrong. One of the hardest jobs I ever had. Come on, you try clapping for 15 or 20 minutes enthusiastically. It was really hard work. Um, back to the hospital. When we left Rome, we, we toured Italy. Uh, we went to southern Italy. Uh, we were fascinated, of course, by the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And here is a picture of Lucy standing on top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. We also went down to southern Italy. And uh, I love the picture on the right because I had stopped the car one day to take a picture of this village, which was built onto the side of a mountain. And these two policemen came over uh, to investigate what in heck we were doing there in the street stopped because they did not see anything that was picture worthy in this uh, place. So we, uh, when we wanted to park our car, we would go into a building and the third or fourth car was uh, the third or fourth floor of these buildings uh, were spacious and parking ramps. We'd have to drive onto an elevator, which was scary and noisy. And then it would take us up to the third or fourth floor. And then we would drive off onto the floor and we could park all day for about 30 cents. So that's how we kind of toured around. Uh, when we left, uh, Rome and we went to southern Italy. Uh, we also went to Sicily and we spent some time on the Isle of Capri. I wish I had put pictures, but I didn't. Then we headed up and we went uh, through the French Riviera um, down to Spain. Uh, we rented a house on the island of Mallorca for a week or two. I don't even remember how long we were there, maybe two weeks. And then we went down to Gibraltar and uh, went over to uh, Fatima 
back to Madrid. We did not see a bullfight because we had done that in Mexico and once was enough. And then we went back to Italy. So to back up now, uh, this is back after we were in the French Riviera, uh, we were fascinated by the little principality of Monaco because it was beautiful for one thing. And also because there, because Princess Grace and Prince Rainier lived there. On the right, it shows a picture that I took of their palace. And uh, we were pretty, of course they weren't home when we were there, so we didn't shake hands, but uh, we were excited just to be in the place, place where they lived. Here's the house that we rented on the island of Mallorca. That's the place where a lot of uh, European tourists spend their vacation. And it's the place where I had one of the outstanding moments of my life because uh, was the European people, especially from Denmark, there were people there, uh, they were saying that Americans could never swim in the waters off of Mallorca because it was way too cold. So of course, you knew, I stood up on a rock, dived into the water and impressed these people that Americans weren't all such wimps as they thought we were. Also at Fatima, oh my goodness, we were so impressed with the story of Fatima and the Blessed Virgin appearing to these three children. That was back in 1917, May, June, and July of 1917. And actually, Fatima is now a symbol of protection and power and strength. But I was fascinated to learn that it also has symbolizes the five pillars of Islam. They are faith, prayer, pilgrimage, fasting, and charity. And yes, um, uh, I can't remember what I was going to say about that. Fatima. Uh, anyway, when we left Spain, we drove, we spent some time in Venice in Northern Italy, and then we drove through Yugoslavia, which is now Slovenia. We drove through Croatia and Bosnia, Herzegovina, Macedonia, and on to Thessalonica, Greece on the Aegean Sea. But our adventure that I wanted to tell you about started when we were in Athens on May 14th, by now it was May and it was 1962. At high noon was this big wedding. The town was just packed with people and it was the wedding of Prince Don Juan Carlos of Spain and Princess Sophia of Greece. And because of my press pass, I was given a translator and allowed into the press box at the Greek Orthodox Cathedral there. So along with the AP, the UP and the UPS, UPI, I mean, the Medelia Times Messenger was represented at this royal wedding. Um, the wedding uh, was just, there were eight bridesmaids. They were all of royal birth. And I can tell you that this wedding brought together, we learned later that it brought together four other unmarried couples. Uh, in the next three years, there were four more royal weddings. Because when you stop to think of it, if you're a royal person in Europe, you wouldn't have very many opportunities to meet other eligible royals. So that happened this day. But I have this picture here because definitely Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier commanded more attention than the king and queen of Greece. And uh, we were, I was glad to be up close to them. Um, the picture on the right shows Princess Sophia and uh, to her left is her husband, Prince Don Juan Carlos. They had a six month honeymoon and the highlight was visiting John Kennedy at the White House. So I got this picture later. Um, by the way, I want you to know that at, this couple reigned as King and Queen of Spain from 1975 until 2014. So for 39 years, Princess Sophia and Don Juan Carlos reigned. They had three children and their son Felipe is now the king of Spain. So they have been married this May. They will be celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Isn't that something? 
when we were in Athens, we met a young man, his name was Alex, and he had, he, his, uh, well, I don't know, he was in the military. Anyway, he invited us to have dinner with his family and they had a big party and they welcomed us uh, so that uh, I couldn't understand what was going on until finally one of the relatives told us in English that uh, he had told his family that he was going to marry me. I think he saw me as a golden ticket to the United States. That was his ambition to go to America. And, um, but I wanted to tell you that everywhere we went in Greece, we seemed to attract lots of men. I guess there weren't a lot of women out at cafes. And uh, so once again, we seemed to attract crowds of boys and men. This is, Alex gave me his picture to carry close to my heart, but um, I had to say goodbye to him, sadly enough for him. This picture on the right shows Lucy uh, with a young man, his name was John and he was from England and we traveled with him for a while when we were in Greece. But there goes our car, Flame and Mamie up in the air getting loaded onto a ship uh, because we wanted to cross the Mediterranean to go to Northern Africa. Now, in the meantime, we've learned that Alex had deserted the military and he had gone to London looking for Lucy and me. And uh, we learned later he'd been at the American Express office uh, waiting for us to show up, which we just didn't do. Instead, we took our car, got on, here's, here's Greece, and here's Athens. We sailed across the entire Mediterranean and then uh, landed in, oh my gosh, wait a minute. That's not right. Let, I, hit the wrong button, landed uh, in Alexandria and then drove down to Cairo. And we did go down as far as Luxor and uh, viewed the uh, Valley of the Kings. When we were in uh, uh, Egypt, of course, we did all the tourist stuff right away. It took us two days to get our car out of customs in Alexandria, but then we went right down to Cairo and um, we did the uh, pyramids and the Sphinx at Giza, uh, went to Cairo and drove down to Luxor. The Valley of the Kings was another adventure, but when we were there, we decided to take a shortcut to go across the desert because our plan was to, we wanted to go to India. Um, so we hired a guide to drive us across the desert, but about 20 minutes into the desert, he quit and uh, just pointed the way. There was no road. We were just driving on sand. And uh, he pointed the way and we took off. Now, I, wanted, I don't want to recommend driving across the Sahara Desert in June because our toothpaste melted, turned to liquid, our lipstick melted, and the piston in our Volkswagen melted. So we were stranded in the desert for an afternoon until a small camel caravan came by. They had a rope, luckily, and they were very nice, the couple of men that were with it. And they towed our car with the rope to an oil camp right on the Red Sea coast. The name of the oil camp was Raz Garib. And it was really an isolated place. I think that we possibly were the first and the only tourists ever to come there, I don't know but we soon became subjects of wonderful hospitality. In fact, um, this picture shows us, they gave us a cook and a house. The man in the white turban was our cook. And the man sitting beside me is Hazem Basset. I'll tell you more about him later. They even had a pigeon roast in our honor. Uh, here is the house that they gave us. Well, apparently they had an old pickup truck and they filed it down, filed down the piston to fit into our Volkswagen. And then it worked perfectly. In fact, we drove it for many years after that. Lucy drove it for many years after that. Um, the story of Hazem Basset, he's on the right side of the picture with his arm around me, is that he was born in Cairo, but he was raised, he was educated in England and his goal was also to come to the United States. 
Now we met several, uh, we met three young couples who were living there in Ras Garib with their children. All of them spoke four or five languages and so did their children. So we were very impressed with, their, with these people. But most of them were not happy with their positions because they were not free to come and go as they wanted. The oil company was controlled by the government. It was the Anglo-Egyptian oil company, which was a branch of the Royal Dutch oil company, which we learned later was a branch of Shell oil. Now, Ras Garib is a leading center of petroleum production and it's a big city. What did we do for two weeks in Ras Garib besides, we were entertained all the time. Haas and Bassett really took it upon himself to entertain us. And they had built a nine hole golf course out on the desert and we played golf for two weeks every day. And I think Hazem must have taken time off. He was kind of our um, entertainer of the week. I really liked him a lot. Uh, the first time I really liked somebody and, uh, but finally we had to say goodbye. And so we went, um, we left Raz Garib with our beautiful car and we drove up to the Suez Canal. I put a picture of, that, of the Suez Canal in here. This is how it looked in 1961, not like it looks today. But um, because the, the, the canal, of course, has been in the news in the, this last month when a ship got stuck sideways there. So we've learned that it was monsoon season. So we did not, uh, we canceled our plan to drive to India which was probably smart. Instead, we went north through uh, Syria and Lebanon and Jordan. Um, and I took this picture because uh, I was so amused that this is the main highway leading into Jordan. And they have a sign in English that said, welcome to the Holy Land. So Lucy and I took a picture of that sign. We thought it was funny. I also included this picture. This is the countryside of Jordan in the Holy Land because my grandson Finn wanted to, me to tell you about our hashish adventure. So uh, of course we were so interested in these Middle Eastern countries because their cultures were so very different. But one day a couple of uh, young men invited us to go out into the countryside and smoke hashish. Well, we had never done that before. So we thought it would be kind of a good adventure. And we took them up on their invitation. We sat under a tree. And while these two men just went off into La La Land, they were having some kind of a psychedelic experience. Lucy and I smoked our joint and sat there and looked at each other and nothing happened. I mean, the entire hashish adventure was a total bust, nothing. So we never did that again, actually. We did get interested in the status of the Arab refugees. Now you all know that in 1948, about 1 million Palestinian Arabs were expelled from their homes and they had to go to Lebanon and Syria and Jordan when the United Nations declared Israel a country. So we were told there were about 60 refugee camps for displaced Palestinians. And that happened in 1948. We were there in 1962. And so they had already been living out here in the desert for 14 years. Now it has been 75 years 73 years, I'm sorry, and I just recently was told that uh, the refugee camps are still there. The problems have not been solved. I do think that the government paid each person there the equivalent to about three cents a day for being displaced. We were told that there were like 75,000 Arabs living in this particular refugee camp, which was near Jericho. Now, many of the refugee camps that we went to, see, because we had our own car, we were able to drive, uh, go wherever we wanted to. So uh, we visited about three refugee camps and many, we saw many people, most in fact, living in tents, not nice dwellings like you see here, but in tents and some, a few 
in mud huts. A big problem, of course, was getting clean water. The other thing that interested us in middle, the Middle East was the status of women. Uh, and we were able to go to some villages, some Druid villages. Um, uh, what do I say here? Oh, yeah. Now, the status of women, I'm sure, has improved since we were there in 1962. But at that time, a wife was property of her husband, pretty much like a donkey. A Muslim wife never unveiled before a man. The Quran commanded obedience to the man. The husband was allowed to beat his wife and she could not divorce or vote or hold office or own property. So I'm sure that many women were happy in these places but their inferior status really upset Lucy and me. And we were very interested. Of course, the other thing interesting we did was swim on the Red Sea. You don't swim in the Red Sea because it's so salty, but we swam on it. And the second thing was we were allowed to go to a place where uh, scholars were translating the Dead Sea Scrolls right there by the Dead Sea. And that interested us. Um, I want to tell you that, I'll go back for a minute. I want to tell you that the entire Middle East was so fascinating and such a strange adventure for us. It had both charm and mystery, of course, uh, but we were a sensation wherever we went. And I just want to tell you about one time when we were in Syria, and I think we stopped in a town for a stop sign or something. Uh, we never mastered the Arabic language or the Greek language. We just, that was over our head. It was impossible for us to even speak a little bit of those languages. But this time we stopped in this uh, town and a crowd of men and boys surrounded our car. There were so many that we could not go forward. And uh, police, two policemen came in order to break up the crowd so that we could uh, proceed. Now, we weren't in any danger. We didn't feel afraid because these people were just curious. They wanted to touch the car and they wanted to look at American women, I guess. But it, that was not such an unusual adventure. Um, when, we, when we left the Middle East, um, where's my cursor? Here it is. We, oh, here it is, okay. We, yes, we drove up through Turkey. Uh, we went to Istanbul and that was another adventure because Istanbul was a Turkish delight on a moonlit night. Then we crossed the strait and went uh, through uh, Bulgaria, Romania, which is now Serbia and Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, which is no longer there it, or it's there, but it's, not, it's a different name. Um, and But when we were in uh, Belgrade, we actually saw Marshal Tito in a plane, in a, in a parade. He was just, we were standing on the sidewalk and, he, and there was a parade going by and Marshal Tito was there. So I was pretty thrilled to see him because he was kind of a big name back in those days. After we left uh, uh, Austria, back we go to Austria, we went right straight to Paris because um, we wanted to see Paris, of course. And then we also ferried to Ireland and Scotland and then back to England. But in Paris, it, we spent, oh, I don't know how long we spent there, but it was a wonderful tourist adventure. This picture on the right is the Champs-Elysees and that's the main street of Paris. And at, having come from the Middle East, we felt so smart and so privileged to be walking down uh, Champs-Elysees and looking in shop windows. Of course, we didn't do any shopping. We were pretty low on money by the time we got to Paris, but we weren't low enough to deprive ourselves of the arts. We spent several days at the Louvre and we also had a wonderful nightlife in Paris, of course, that was uh, just, uh, an adventure and fun. When we left Paris, we went, uh, we ferried our car and drove around Ireland for about over a week. 
um, we enjoyed Ireland a lot, maybe because of my Irish heritage. We also went to Scotland and we spent another week driving around Scotland. And finally we came back to London and we got on uh, the SS Queen Mary. Now this ship only took one um, week, one week to cross the ocean, whereas we'd spent two weeks coming over and uh, there was no hockey team on the, the ship, but it still was uh, a wonderful adventure to come back to the United States finally. Uh, and that is the end of my talk. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you Mike. It's, it's really too bad you didn't have any fun on that trip. <laughs> What, what was the, uh, the overall duration? How long were you gone? Well, we left in uh, August and uh, we came back in September. So 11 months, maybe, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit over a year. We were gone a little over a year. Okay, and what happened to uh, Maisie, well, was it? When we came back, uh, I married Steve. We, we actually got jobs at the VA hospital in Minneapolis but I pretty quickly married Steve Anderson and Lucy after a while married Tom Helfter, who's the guy in the plaid shirt sitting here uh, on this wave, Tom, so they know, so everybody knows who we are. There he is. Thank you. And, um, and Lucy worked for public health in Lesseur County and Tom, she and Tom lived in Lee Center. So she and I really remained very close friends and we never had an argument in all of the time we were together um, until Lucy tragically died in 2016. She fell and accidentally fell and hit her head. It was just a freak, awful accident. Um, and we were friends right up to that time. Did you have any other, not similar, but uh, probably I, a variety I can't on? stop my share now? Sure. Okay, then I can see people. Oh, good, okay. Thank you. Did, you. did you guys go on any other adventures, not rivaling that one, but uh, other smaller ones? After, no, we settled. Uh, I took 18 years off of my career to raise five children, actually six. And um, uh, Lucy also, so we, no, we never took another trip or traveled after we got married. We had, we'd been there, done that. <laughs> I'm very impressed with your trip. I wish I could have gone along. I'm surprised though that you didn't have more fear. I mean, two single women traveling so to so many countries. I can tell you that things were very different back in 1961 and 62. We were not in danger at any point in that entire year that we knew about. And yes, I think we took some risks, but it would be impossible to duplicate that kind of thing now because it wouldn't be safe, nor could anybody afford it. I mean, come right. on, we worked for two years and we saved enough money to buy a car and travel for one year. So that just wouldn't be possible. And what did your parents think about this trip? <laughs> well, um, act, I forgot to tell you that uh, I, um, I wrote a, a post my, for my mother's newspaper, I have a copy here. Um, every week I sent a, a article back to the Medelia Times Messenger and she published it. And if we have a minute or a time, so I'd like to read you an article that I wrote 60 years ago. Uh, is that okay if I do that? Yes. Oh yeah. Please. All right, here's what I wrote. I said, shortly after we had driven through no man's land from Hungary into Austria, we got the US Armed Forces Radio from Munich. The Voice of America came on. That and Radio Free Europe are blocked behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, if we thought there was something wrong with our radio. On came Bing Crosby singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And well, we both cried, honestly. We were overwhelmed to the point of tears. I felt like writing a long oratory on what it means to be an American and shouting it loudly to the whole world. It was because we so clearly realized that this vague thing called democracy means life itself and therefore means everything. 
I don't care how many bad things are involved or how many major or minor disadvantages result. Our way of life seemed so much better that comparison is ridiculous. And everybody seemed to know it better than we ourselves know it. In Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary, we met nothing but friendliness and hospitality when our identity as Americans was discovered. During the course of this year, we have met many people who think that United States is utopia, a paradise. The only ambition of many of them is to go there, to be there, to live there. These people, mostly young people that we met, seem to think that they can get, if they can just get into the United States, then their troubles will be over. Everything will be fine and they'll have a life of happiness. But, and we've gone on discouraging this type of unrealistic thinking until just last week when we finally realized that in comparison, their concept is true. So <laughs> that was one of the columns. That was the last column I think that I wrote. And I, out of 42 columns, 50 columns, something like that. Pat, did you have any trouble finding gas for the car? Well, we weren't allowed to take the car into Russia because um, uh, there weren't gas stations or roads, but we did not know. We always, we were pretty, con as Lucy was in charge of the car. So she, you know, she was good at, at finding gas stations and gauging how much gas we would need and how far we could go without it. So I would say no, not only did we never get lost, even though we had no cell phones, um, uh, we did. We never ran out of gas either. <laughs> Thanks to Lucy. I I have a question and then a follow up question. Oh hi, Jeremy. Hey, uh, can you speak uh, French fluently? No, I don't speak French at all. <laughs> I've heard different things. I've heard that if you try to speak to a French person and your your French isn't very good, they'll just start to talk to you in English. Oh, and I all, but I also heard that if you don't speak perfect French to, to a French person, they will ignore you, <laughs> you know? I think those are stereotypes that aren't always exactly true. They're probably true sometimes, but not all the time. I can tell you everywhere we went, even even in Ras Garib, this isolated little place on the Red Sea coast, there were all these people there who spoke perfect English. So we always, and in Russia also, mm -hmm. we actually were invited into home, uh, two people's homes in Moscow because they were students and they spoke English. So I think that in back in, at least in 1961, English was taught to children in school. Just because it was a good idea. So we never had much trouble. And I don't know how I could speak Italian. I think maybe it was a past life thing, who knows, but somehow I was able. And also medical language is quite universal, you know. So I was able to work at the hospital. I just wanna thank you for your very articulate, well-organized presentation. Brought Thanks. back many memories for me because I'd been in several of those places and experienced a Russian celebration of the end of 50, 50 years anniversary at the end of the war with a cast of thousands that yeah. went on all day like you described. So I think I've had some similar experiences to yours. <laughs> the only scary thing for us in Russia was when we had to hand over our passports to the in-tourist organization. Mm -hmm. But we did it, and of course, it turned out to be just fine. Mm -hmm. The other scary thing was that plane ride from Moscow to Leningrad. That plane was not pressurized, and it really hurt our ears. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, but we were so grateful to land safely. I think we went up and kissed the hand of the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> when you were at Fatima, was it very uh, commercialized at that point in '61? Not at all. No, there was. Uh, now there's a big cathedral there. Uh, yes, oh, I've been there recently in the last few years, and it is very commercialized, and um, it's it was disappointing for me. 
need to see that commercialization of Fatima. The friendliest people were at Fatima and we did see tourists coming and when they came, because they come on the 13th of every month, apparently, for some reason, and uh, they, they were sleeping out in the outdoors, on the ground. Yeah, and people we were, crawling on their, uh, walking on their knees. Yes. Miles. At that time, there was one hotel, and I think they had room for 15 people in this hotel or something like that. And the thousands of people slept outdoors on the ground. I was able to meet the aunt of one of the children. Um, uh, and it was, I mean, she was probably in her 80s or 90s. And it was just uh, almost a religious experience meeting her. It's an impressive place. Yeah. Say, Pat, I'm wondering what kind of response you got from your friends and neighbors back in Medellin when you returned, who had been reading about your adventures along the way. I don't know. I could ask my brother and my sister that question. I don't know what kind of a response I got. Just ordinary. I don't think anybody thought it was a very big deal. But I have to tell you a little story, a little secret I have, that I did give several uh, travel talks because in that time I had a lot of slides. I couldn't use my slides today because, of course, I don't even have a projector or anything. I still have the slides, though. But uh, I had gone down to Miniopa Park and taken, I stood down on the bottom and I took a picture of the falls and it was just a lovely picture. And anyway, I threw that in with all my pictures of the Alps and uh, spectacular scenery. And I never told anybody that it really came from Mankato. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have, uh, when things get back to normal, if you have another presentation at Vine that we can come to in person, I would love to see those slides and hear you talk about them because I thought you were really funny along the way too. Oh, thanks, thanks. I tried to be light. <laughs> you succeeded. It's hard when you can't hear your audience, you know, laughing at your jokes, I think. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it is. I'm going to uh, do another presentation uh, for Tom and the Helter family, as long as it would have been very helpful if Lucy could have helped me with this talk, because so many things I just couldn't remember. Like, I don't remember if we went skiing when we were at Zurich uh, in Switzerland. I know we wanted to ski in Switzerland, but I don't remember if we really did it or not. And of course, Lucy could have told me if she had been here. So I'm going to do a whole presentation, I hope, for the Helter family. Uh, Tom and Lucy have three children and, and a bunch of grandchildren. And so uh, that will be a special thing to just, and I'll focus more on Lucy's part of our trip. <laughs> oh, Tom, you're muted. You're... You got to press unmute, Tom. Oh, you don't care. All right. There we go. No, I don't know where that's at. You're good, Tom. We can hear you. Just did it. Oh, okay. What I was going to say is it surprised me about the Alps because Lucy and I had gone skiing different times when we were younger in Colorado. And that's when I learned she was kind of afraid of heights. <laughs> she, she'd get real nervous when you get up high. Well, you, you really should have used that uh, double martini method. That was good. <laughs> good, uh, good hey. presentation. Hi. Hey, Pat. Um, yeah. Uh, when I went to Japan, I would ask for directions to my hotel, and the person would walk me to the hotel. So, I know you have, you were going by maps, yeah. Were there, but I bet you had to ask for directions sometimes too. Um, oh yeah. What were the? Did you have any similar experience like? Well, I remember one time we were wanted to go to Stockholm and uh, we stopped and asked, there was a fork in the road. We stopped and asked which road will take us to Stockholm. And we said like something like Stockholm, question mark, and they, nobody could understand us. And finally, one person said, oh, Stockholm. We had pronounced it wrong. <laughs> But we, I, we didn't get lost. We oftentimes mm -hmm. stayed in youth hostels or pensions. Um, 
so that's where we met so many people all the time. Okay. Any other questions, Clayton? No. Oh. Yeah. I think he did a tremendous uh, yeah. job. It's as good as any college lecture I've listened to. <laughs> Thanks, Clayton. <laughs> hey, Pat. This is uh, Doug. Uh, what, what a what a fascinating story, and I really think you need to sell the movie rights to Hollywood for this. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, Pat, I'm I'm curious. You said uh, you you never studied Italian, but you you were somehow managed to make yourself understood. Yes. Wow, that's remarkable. Enough so that I could even chart in Italian in the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but you didn't. You you had never actually studied the language. Oh, but I took Latin in high school, and I think yeah, I had that too. Yeah. So that was the basics for. Yeah. Well, that's cool. of course speaking uh, you know you're where i'm a former professor of spanish but um when i've been abroad i've often gone to italian movies and um after a while i stop reading the subtitles because i get into the rhythm it's close enough to spanish you know there you go <laughs> but uh what an adventure my god uh for two young women it, it, it would have been uh, Verging on heroic for a couple of guys, but for <laughs> for young women like that, uh, you did seem to have a lot of uh, uh, assistance along the way from friendly folks, and uh, that was really nice. That's true. We did not plan our trip in advance. We just went where the whim took us, and we stayed as long as we were interested. So it really was a day by day kind of adventure. Yeah, I remember uh, back uh, when they used to advertise Volkswagen that uh, to go to Europe and buy a Volkswagen because uh, a family at that time had enough, uh, what, what, what did they call it, free duty-free credits that uh, several people could combine their credits in the same family and pay no import taxes if they brought a VW or in any vehicle from Europe. Um, so I assume you... When you got to the States, did you have to uh, pay anything uh, to import it? You know, I don't remember if I suppose we did, but actually Lucy took over and Lucy drove that car. We, it, the car sailed with us on the Queen Mary and um, Lucy drove it for years after that. Uh, and yeah. I suppose we did have to pay, but I don't remember, of course. Wouldn't have been much, I don't think. But uh, yeah, quite a vehicle too. <laughs> Did imagine did, imagine did, that uh, trip costing two hundred dollars, in with meals included. After yeah. She, after she got back, she traded it in on a Carmen Ghia, and then she sold that just before we got married. Oh, oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember those two. The the sporty Volkswagen. Yeah. She was quite a sporty gal. I, you know, the thing that struck me with their presentation, Pat, was. You know, two pretty ordinary, conventional girls, and yet you took advantage of your time in your life, and and um, you know had a little bit of a spirit of adventure. And boy, I mean, I applaud you for that. Thanks. Oh yeah. <laughs> Did many Russians speak English? Uh, we met young Russians, not not older people, but we met uh, university students who uh, who spoke English. Yes. One of them was a young man and he had a wife and child and he took us to his apartment and uh, we could see how they lived. And uh, it, was, it was an honor for us to, to be able to do that with him. I think the Soviet Union required English in their schools um, to make it easier when they took over the world to uh, tell us what to do. <laughs> <laughs> So. All right. Any other questions? If not, thank you, Pat. As I say, I've, I've heard this before, but I'm as intrigued the second time as I was the first time. And I love your dry humor. That uh, That's what really makes it for me. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank um, you. Thanks to all of you.
Thank, nice thank to see you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And, and we'll be back when uh, when Pat is ready to talk about the rest of her travels in her in her life. We'll do this <laughs> okay. all again. Uh -huh. All right, well, thank you all for attending today, for joining Pat in her adventure and Vine as well. So uh, we, we hope you have a great, great rest of your day and this will be available for viewing on vinevolunteers.com. Look under virtual Vine and it should be there as early as this afternoon. Okay.